turn in your Bibles to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. While you turn there, we're going to quickly review just a point, a thought, something that I think we need repetition in because it is so vitally important to the Christian walk, to the Christian life from chapter 10. This is a key verse. It's a pivotal verse. It's a verse we're probably very well familiar with. We hear many times sermons after sermons have been preached off this in chapter 10, verse 10. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came, Jesus speaking, that they may have life and have it abundantly. Life and life abundantly. And what's drawn here is truly what we talk about many times in our church here, about the war between the spirit and the flesh. The war between the spirit and the flesh. There is the one who tempts only to steal, kill, and destroy. And then there is one who comes to give abundant life. And Satan, that thief, that one that comes only to kill, steal, and destroy, he will always appeal to the flesh of man. Always will appeal to something of man's flesh. However, our Lord always appeals to our spirit. Back when we studied Amos, when we were studying through all the minor prophets, we came upon two pivotal verse, verses in Amos. Amos 5, 4. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me and live. And if we skip to verse 7, also key, pivotal verse, important for our lives. O you who turn justice to wormwood and cast down righteousness to the earth, you who turn righteous living into a bitter life. And this is so important for us as believers today living in our world because as we were studying the Old Testament, the Old Testament gave very little clarity to an afterlife. Very little clarity. There, most doctrines that we have concerning an afterlife are from our Lord himself, Jesus, and from the New Testament. This is where we get this. There's a few verses... A key verse would be Isaiah 26, 19. And we even read in the Gospels that there was a group of Jews called the Sadducees. And the Sadducees were not ignorant men by any way, shape, or form. But they believed in no afterlife because there just wasn't that focus in the Old Testament about an afterlife. But Isaiah 26, 19, your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awaken, sing for joy. For your dew is the dew of light, and the earth will give birth to the dead. And this is what we're going to study a little bit about tonight in chapter 11 with Martha's discourse with Jesus about Lazarus. She's going to reference this, speaking of a revelation, or not revelation, a resurrection, about a resurrection. And she has this verse in the back of her mind. But you know, when we study the Old Testament, we see the focus that is given to our life here on earth. We realize that we should also have not just a concern of an afterlife. Pastor Bob Beeman, the picture we have on the back wall of he and his mother, he has dealt with kids and teenagers for many years, and the question always is, can I do this, that, or another and still go to heaven? Which is a really bad question because his answer is always, yes, you can, because salvation is by grace through faith. And in our culture in America, we bring up children very wrong many times in households because we'll say, little Johnny, do not lie because liars don't go to heaven. And even many wives, church-going wives, have heckled their husbands and nagged their husbands, don't do this, that, or another. Quit drinking or you won't go to heaven. And salvation is not by anything we do or don't do. It's by belief only. 
But there is also still a concern about our life here today. It's not, can I do this, that, or another and still go to heaven? The question really should be, can I do this, that, or another and live the abundant life? The life that Jesus came to give me. If I do these things, will I have an abundant life? We just studied the woman that was about to be stoned because of her adultery. And Jesus tells her to go and sin no more. And it's this discourse. It's look what your lifestyle has brought you to. Men are picking up stones and justly going to throw rocks at you till you die. Is this an abundant life for you? No, it's not. Go and sin no more. It's not abundant. I came to give you an abundant life. Go and sin no more. So we should be very concerned today about how we live because this is what Jesus came to bring us. Not only does he tell us not to do these things, but he empowers us to be overcomers. He empowers us to have that abundant life. That which by the flesh we had no power to have on our own. An abundant life. We should not just be concerned about the afterlife. Because Jesus did not come just so you could go to heaven. John 10, 10, that we may have life and have it abundantly. A life here, a life now, a physical life today, an abundant life. And when we pair this with Amos, we see that seek God and live is an abundant life. We see that that thief, though, comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And the lie we're fed is that somehow salvation is tied to not doing this or not doing that. And what's that do to the flesh of man? When we lay burdens on them of don't do this, don't do that, or you won't go to heaven, it makes the righteous life wormwood or makes it a bitter life. But it's not. It's not. It is an abundant life when I have received Jesus Christ and he empowers me to go and sin no more. He empowers me. Let's go on into John chapter 11. John 11. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with, anoint, uh, with an ointment and wiped his feet with her hair whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the, so the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in a place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let's go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you are going there again. Jesus answered, there are not 12 hours in a day. And if anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks at night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's, asleep, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant taking a rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Jesus has died, or Lazarus has died. Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. But let's go to him. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us go that we may die with him. 
Let's concentrate on verse 9 just a moment. Jesus answered, Are there not 12 hours in a day? And if anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. We read back in John 8 and verse 12. Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but he will have life, light of life. And we're going to read in John 12, where Jesus says, I have come into this world as light, so whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. And Jesus was telling his disciples to do something that by sight did not seem prudent. Let's go where these people are trying to kill us. Not a very wise decision. I think that if tomorrow someone said, Let's go to Cincinnati, and people in Cincinnati were trying to kill me. I probably would not go. But he was telling them to do something that didn't seem to them to be very wise. And we will be many times faced with things in our lives, in the Christian walk, that may not seem to be the most prudent at times, especially if it is to do God's work. I mean, I think if any, finance, any couple that was planning on going on the mission field, they seek the counsel of a financial planner, he will tell them that it's crazy, that this does not fit well to go to Africa to preach the gospel. This doesn't fit well in your portfolio. This is not a wise investment of how to spend your money. You could become bankrupt in that. But they have to walk in the light in this situation. And when we do these things that, for the gospel's sake, that seem foolish by others, we shouldn't be very surprised that it seems foolish. Because by sight, the gospel is foolishness to the world. The Bible even says it is foolishness. 1 Corinthians 1.18 For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. If you were to talk to a career specialist about whether to become a pastor... He would probably tell you that pastors don't make very much. If you drew my pastor's salary, you'd be especially upset with the uh, return on investment because I don't take a salary. There is not much money in pastoring. Truly, there is not. The career specialist would say this is probably not a good thing to go to. Not the wisest industry to seek. It's foolishness to him, but it is the power of God to us. If you talk to your budget advisor of how to spend your money and to set up your budget, probably donating to missionaries or the church or putting your money into any religious uh, venture that spreads the gospel, Probably, tell, the financial planner would probably say, 10% is way too much. He would probably say it's foolishness. But to us, it is the power of God. It is the very power of God. So our priorities as believers, it cannot be based upon worldly wisdom. All the financial planners, all the legal counsel, all these things cannot give us what God has for us. We have to walk in the light as he is in the light. We have to make our decisions based upon the word of God. This is how we choose to spend our money because today in the New Testament, it is not 10% of how I spend my money as a tithe. It is 100% that every dollar that I have, I am bought with a price. And every dollar I spend, I spend it unto the Lord. 
whether I'm buying a soda at the grocery store or putting gas in my tank, I spend it unto God. And I am a good steward with my money because I'm called to be a good steward of my money. I live by the word of God. Psalms 119, 105. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So do we follow worldly wisdom in our decisions? No. That is walking in the darkness of the night. We will stumble. We are guaranteed to stumble if that's the way we make our decisions. But if we are walking by the word of God, we know we are in the light. 1 John 1, 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. This is something your financial planner, your career planner, your budget advisor can't give you. They cannot give you fellowship with one another. They cannot cleanse you of your unrighteousness. So why would we seek them first? Because systemically, if you find people that spend their money and are always broke, even though somehow they have money coming in, it's not a budgeting problem. It's something much deeper. It is a spiritual problem. Because God is their provider. And we know God will take care of us. But if we're seeking first the kingdom of God, and we are truly living that I spend every dollar unto God, I will make wise decisions with my money because I am spending it unto God. It is a spiritual problem that has to be taken care of first. We can set forth the greatest plans. We can write out the perfect budget, but there is no power to follow it without the spiritual issue being dealt with first. All the worldly counsel for finances, all the worldly counsel for marriages, all the worldly counsel of how to rear your children or how to retire correctly or anything else that we seem to worry about as Americans today, all the best planners cannot do what the Word of God can do. And that is to change your heart. Many times marriages can be easily reconciled when the two come to Jesus. And they are seeking God in the relationship and not seeking their own satisfaction. It is a spiritual problem. It's not a relationship problem with one another. It is a spiritual problem that God has to deal with. And it can only be fixed through the word of God. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It is that light that we receive that changes the heart of man. It fixes financial issues because it fixes the root of the problem. It fixes marital problems because it fixes the root of the problem. It fixes what none of the worldly wisdom can fix. Our heart with God and our fellowship with one another. We also come to a very interesting verse in this, this portion that we've read so far. In verse 16, it says, So Thomas called the twin, said to the fellow disciples, Let us also go that we may die. Now, I don't know if we can tell from the context here, and I'm not exactly a Greek scholar to exegete the, the Greek to even know, but was this said as a statement of faith? Let's go. If we die, we die with the Lord. Or was this said in sarcasm? Let's go and die with them. I don't know. But I think regardless of the context here of whether Thomas was speaking in sarcasm or whether he was speaking in faith here, 
The important thing that we must see is that he was willing to go. There was an obedience here in Thomas. There was obedience there. And whether we sometimes are a little facetious or sarcastic at what God has told us to do, the important thing is, is even if we're resistant in the heart at times, the obedience of following through is the important thing. We may have our doubts. And I think as we study later on about Thomas, he's called Doubting Thomas. He probably was a little doubting here, but willing to go. Verse 17. Now when Jesus came, he found Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said, Jesus, Lord, if you had said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection. Speaking of Isaiah where we had read. On the last day, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Yes, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. This is that true sinner's prayer, that true confession. The, yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. In this resurrection that Martha speaks of here, this is by this life, in this belief of Jesus Christ. Verse 28, when, he said, when she had said this, she, sent, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping. He was moved deeply. In his spirit greatly troubled. And he said to her, where have they laid him? And, Jesus, and they said to him, Jesus, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could he not, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? There are so many times that we see things. We see situations, but we do not see them as God sees them. And many times in life, we can ask ourselves or even ask God the same kind of question. God, if you could do this or that, raise the dead, heal the blind, couldn't you have kept this from happening in my life? But as we read here, we can know this and we can take comfort in this. That God truly, in no matter what situation you have faced, God has a purpose. He has a purpose for that situation in your life. And there's comfort there. And know this also that when we weep, 
God weeps with us. Just as Jesus wept here over Lazarus, he weeps with you when you're going through these situations. And know this also, that Jesus loves you just as Jesus loved Lazarus. Verse 38, then Jesus deeply moved again and came to the tomb. It was the cave and the stone laid against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, said, Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, at this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this on the account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who died came out his hands and feet bound with linen strips, his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. We have a beautiful picture here of the Christian life and why truly the church is important. Why the church is important in the story of Lazarus. Now, Jesus is crying out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. He's calling to each one of us. Tyler, come out. Nathan, come out. Pastor Clark, come out. And when we've come out, we've been given that new life. Our hands are bound. Our feet are bound. Our face is covered up. We don't see very well. We don't move very well. Our ability is very, very limited. And as a new believer, we are always very limited. Our capacity is very small. And our ability is hindered. Then in verse 44, Jesus says to them, unbind him and let him go. And this is the work of the church. He asked, he told those around him to let him go, to unbind him. And this is through the body life, the church life, that our capacity is enlarged, that the binds are removed from our face, that we can speak. The wraps are cut from our eyes that we can see. Our hands and feet are freed up. And it becomes clearer and clearer. And we become bolder and bolder. It is through body life. But here's the thing about body life and church life and being in the church. And this is why so many people resist the church. It's because the church life stinks. It stinks like a dead man wrapped in, in, in rags for four days. It stinks. There is an odor here. He's been dead four days. And dealing with people in the body, guess what? Many times it stinks. They just were brought back from the dead. Their clothes stink with the stink of death for four days. But it's our responsibility as the church to unbind them to remove the cloths from their eyes and their mouths that they may be free. We have brothers and sisters. They've been dead for years. And they come into the body and guess what? Their lives stink with the stink of death. They stink with the life of the old life. And they're trapped in the grave clothes, just as Lazarus was. 
This unwrapping, it's unpleasant. Absolutely. Because they come in and they don't quite fit the church click. They don't fight, quite fit the church status quo. But what is the result when we remove the cloths from their face and their eyes are opened? And we remove the cloths from their mouth and the, their, their mouths speak from the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, from receiving the word of God. And their hands are unbound and their feet. They are made free. They are made free. They are set free. And what's the result of this? This is the abundant life. The abundant life that Jesus came to bring us. Verse 45. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary had seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like, like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who is the high priest that you said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. Nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people not that the whole nation perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, he made plans to put him to death. Jesus, therefore, no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the region near the wilderness to the town called Ephraim. And there he stayed with his disciples. Now Passover, the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They were looking for Jesus and saying one to another as they stood in the temple, what do you think, that he will not come to the feast at all? Now the chief priest and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know so they might erase, uh, arrest him. We have an amazing prophecy here from an unrighteous man. You know, spiritual gifts are important, they're for the edification of the body, but they're not truly a mark of spirituality. I mean, Jesus, I mean, God in the Old Testament made a donkey speak. He can definitely make you speak. You could even say that it was prophetic in that way. And here's an unrighteous man, does not believe in Jesus. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe Caiaphas ever, at least recorded in Scripture, placed his faith in Jesus. And he is given this amazing prophecy. And it is even called prophecy by the Word of God. That he did not say it of his own accord. But he was prophesied by the Spirit. That it is better for you that one man should die for the people not that the whole nation should perish. Because we know as in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We know in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And we know also in 2 Corinthians 5.14, 
For the love of Christ controls us because we conclude this, that one has died for all, therefore we have all died. And he died for all that those who live might, not, might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their, for their sake died and was raised. That abundant life. As we close, this abundant life in Jesus Christ, the abundant life is by walking in the light. That abundant life is through obedience, even when worldly wisdom seems to tell us otherwise. That abundant life is by knowing God has a purpose in whatever situation that you are facing. Knowing that God weeps when we weep. And knowing Jesus loves us just as he loved Lazarus. That abundant life also is knowing that body life stinks. There are times that coming to church, quite frankly, it stinks but it removes the grave clothes from us. It opens our eyes to see. It unbinds our hands and our feet. That is the abundant life in the church. And most of all, knowing this, that one man died for the people, that the whole world should not perish.